This is the 16th in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll talk about the intersection of plane curves. A problem we've noticed before is that sometimes a polynomial um, function might vanish for all values of uh, that we have in, in a particular field. So, for instance, if we look at this polynomial in the variable t, um, where we're allowing values inside the field z mod 2z, the field which, remember, is the remainders of the integers when we mod out by the evens. Um, so um, so th this vanishes, of course, whatever t we plug in, whether we plug in t as 0 or 1. And similarly, over any finite field, say k, um, we could consider the polynomial, let's say, q of t is the product of all values in the field of t minus c for all of c in the field. And um, of course, then q of c is 0 for all uh, c in the field. So um, a result we've actually made some use of before, um, which is fairly straightforward to see. Uh, suppose that we have uh, uh, variables x is x1 to xn, so you can be interrated as a single letter x to represent all those variables. And then um, suppose that we take a um, we take a, a polynomial uh, p of x uh, over a field a field k, um, and then um, <coughs> suppose that that uh, p of c is zero for all uh, c. Uh, equals c1 to cn uh, with the ci's, uh, c1 to cn, with all the ci's in the field. So for anything you plug in, you always get zero. Um, then, um, then first of all, the field is finite. So for infinite fields, this won't happen. Of course, we can always make a field infinite if we add something to it. Um, but anyway, it's finite, and then also the polynomial can be expressed as a sum of polynomials, um, let's say pi of x, multiplied by this polynomial q evaluated at the just the variable xi, where this q is the same q as up here. This q is this q. Um, so, uh, so it can be written in this simple way. In particular, um, we have the obvious observation that uh, the degree of our polynomial must be greater than or equal to the uh, degree of, of the Q, which is the number of elements in that field K, or else P is, is in fact, just exactly the zero polynomial. So this is key to trying to relate the, the to deal with the problem that, that sometimes polynomials can't really be thought of as functions, so we can relate the polynomial to the function it creates, because we want to see when is the function it creates actually being zero for every input. And we can see it has to be, uh, well, just the zero polynomial, um, in, 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 as long as its degree is small enough, and or the number of elements in the field is large enough. The proof is very straightforward. We start by looking at the proof in one variable, and then we'll go to higher variables. Um, let's suppose we just have one variable. Um, then we know that, um, let's suppose, so uh, our variable is some um, x. Uh, then x minus c divides p of x for every, every c. And so that does it, that means us that the product of all those also divides, so the result is clear. Suppose that there were two variables, and that really captures the essence of the problem. We really don't really need to think about any higher number of variables. Two is enough to get the idea of what's happening. Um, so we have some p of x, y polynomial, and we want to figure out what happens if we're getting it to vanish for every input. So um, let's try. Uh, y equals 0 as an input, we've got that p of x 0 um, is uh, divisible uh, by this uh, q of x, because now it's a one variable polynomial, and we solved the problem for one variable, and so uh, so we can write it as p of x um, 
say zero is q one q sorry q of x times some p one of x. So when we plug in y equals zero, and this therefore says that if we plug in a y, uh, we'll get q of x p one of x plus something involving y's because when you get rid of the y's, that's what show, all that shows up. So it must be somehow something involving y's y's times something, and this is lower degree than p. Um, so, because it's got a y in it. Everybody here has got a factor of y. Um, so, now what we can do is to, um, because this is the stuff that dies when you set y to zero. But um, but this for this part, we're already done. This already satisfies our result. It's divisible by what it should be divisible by. So we can replace p by the difference. We can replace p of x, y. Uh, we might as well just replace it by p of x, y minus q of x, p1 of x, and that'll, uh, as long as we can get the difference to satisfy our result, then you can add that on and it'll still satisfy. And so it's good enough to assume this part's zero. And so you can assume p of x, y um, is uh, some y times h of x, y. Um, and then um, we just have to worry about the problem, well, we've only, we only know what happens when y is not zero. When y is zero, uh, we don't know what happens to h. But we can say that if y is uh, chosen to be some c not 0, then we do get p of x and c, well, p is 0 uh, when we plug in anything in, let's say, well, so what if we plug in, we could plug in x is some b, uh, any b, and then this guy would have to be um, c h of b c, but it has to be 0, and so h has to vanish except possibly um, at, uh, at, 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 at c equals 0. So let's let, um, let, let's call it delta of, um, of t be the product for all c non-zero, 1 minus t over c. So that's a polynomial, um, and uh, what we know about this polynomial is that delta, when you plug in any um, b, um, is, well, it, it, it's going to have a b, if b over c would be 0, it would give you, or b over c um, is 1, then it'll give you 0. And so this guy has to give you 0 if b is not 0, and 1 if b is 0. So we can then write um, h of xy uh, minus uh, delta of y h of x 0 um, vanishes uh, vanishes um, uh, for all for any x y equals any constants in the field um, and it says lower degree it's uh, induction we apply induction on degree to show that it can be written in the required form so I'll leave you to figure out the rest of the details we will uh, want to think about the, the, the notion of calling out low degree factors from a polynomial. So a linear factor, well, a linear function um, for us will just mean a, a polynomial f of x1 to xn is um, uh, some constant x1 plus dot dot plus some constant xn, where these are constants in the field that we're working over. And if uh, not all of these um, these uh, ai constants here are zero, if at least one of them is non-zero, then the set of points, um, the set of uh, points x such that f of x is zero, I'll write that as this in this notation, the set of all solutions of this equation, uh, forms uh, linear hyperplane. Well, it's not just a hyperplane, it's a linear hyperplane, just to say it includes the origin. Okay, so um, so those are the things we're going to think about geometrically. And our lemma here is that, uh, which is again, as a lemma is a little tiny theorem. Um, we have these x, again writing x for these variables. Suppose we have p of x is a polynomial, and um, again over some field k, and um, and f of x is a non-zero linear uh, function, again over the same k, and suppose that p uh, equals zero uh, wherever f of x is zero in our field, right, at any solution of that 
equation from our field, we get this guy also. And suppose that the field um, is big enough, has um, more uh, elements than the degree of the polynomial uh, p of x in, sorry, degree in xi in any variable xi. Um, then um, f of x divides p of x. So this, this tells us if we're vanishing on some on some linear hyperplane, then and we have sufficient control over the degree not being um, not being being too huge, then we get we get that uh, we can divide by the by the linear function. And the proof is is very elementary. Um, we can always change variables to uh, uh, change variables by linear uh, change of variables uh, to get that our nonlinear function, it's not everywhere zero, we can just make it be that linear function by linear change of variables. And so um, we expand our polynomial p of x in the x1 variable as powers of x1. Um, if there's a, a non-zero a constant term, a constant term, right? No, no, no x1 in it in that expansion. So no constant term in, in x1s, so no x1s in it. Um, then set x1 to zero, and that non-zero constant term, constant in x1, uh, that it vanishes for all uh, all inputs, all values of of the other variables x2 to dot 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 dot. And so, um, uh, so, uh, but we have p of uh, zero. Then x two to x n is not zero polynomial. Maybe it's a non-zero constant term, non-zero polynomial. And then you just apply the previous result. Um, so those are those are some some simple observations that help us to understand how to find the near factors when we're working over finite fields, and we want to be able to to work without having to pass to too high a, uh, an extension of the field to be able to get things going. Let's think about resultants in many variables. Um, so we of course do a result only in one variable, but then leaving leaving the other variables as uh, sitting there as variables. So suppose we have um, some b of x and some uh, some b of x and some c of x, and these are polynomials in some s of x, uh, one variable. Um, we'll assume there's just one variable x. Um, then and suppose that, that, that s is a is a commutative ring. All of our rings are commutative with one commutative ring with with identity. Um, and suppose the degree of b is some m and the degree of c is some n. Then um, uh, we've essentially said this already that where it's possible to write the resultant of the b of x and the c of x polynomials somehow it's it's a number which doesn't we can just write as say r or something like that it doesn't have any x in it at all but it happens to somehow be possible to express it using a, a bazoo coefficient type of technique um, which we saw we could work out um, but as a combination of, of B and C uh, with polynomials. Uh, th these are all polynomials. They all have X's in them, but somehow the X's all cancel out and the final result is just the resultant. Um, so with U of X uh, and V of X, polynomials in, uh, in X with the degree of U of X is less than or to N minus 1 and the degree of v of x less than or equal to m minus 1. And this is really something we've already seen, so I won't give a proof of it. Um, it's just a, the fact that we, that well, we know how we compute the results. We saw explicit expressions for the u and the v, and we saw them, I guess, before maybe over arbitrary fields, but it's quite, quite, quite straightforward to see that the same thing's working over any commutative ring. But our real interest in this, uh, in this lecture is not in, 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 in um, these one variable issues. We're really interested in several variables or let's just say in two variables. So from now on, we're all we're going to have throughout the rest of this lecture, we're going to have two variables, x and y. Um, and we're, again, we're always working over a field, uh, some field k. And uh, let's look at 
uh, the resultant of, of two polynomials. So the result now is going to depend on x if we take resultant in the y variable of b of x, y, c of x, y. By resultant in the y variable, I mean pretend these are rational functions in x, but with polynomials in uh, coefficients in y. They are, in fact, supposed to be polynomials of x and y, but um, but we treat them just as functions of y only, polynomials in y only, with coefficients that have x's in them. And we calculate out the resultant just in the y variable, thinking of y as the variable. Um, so let's see what that looks like in examples um, uh, and why we would care so much about it. A simple example, b of x, y is y plus x, and c of x, y is y. And I'll leave you to check that the resultant in y of b of x, y, c of x, y, which again I want to call r of x, um, is going to be, um, is just going to be x. Um, now what does that mean geometrically? Well, algebraically it means therefore that uh, r of x is supposed to be 0, so that means x is supposed to be 0, uh, just when they have a common factor. And you can see that they have that common factor because if you set uh, x to 0, you get that they both turn into y. You get rid of this guy here and it just becomes y and they have, do have a common factor of y. So this seems to be working very well in that it's detecting common factors. The problem is uh, more subtle though. Let's look at b of x and y is x, y squared plus y and c of x, y is x y y squared x squared x y squared plus y plus one, and so that will compute out the um, the resultant. Before we do, before we do, let's let's think about geometrically. Well, we could think geometrically about this example. Actually, it's a very simple example. Um, we've got a simple picture where uh, c of x and y is y, and so y is zero along this horizontal line, that's this guy here, and this guy, b of x plus y, that's that's this line here, um, that's this guy. Um, and so uh, it vanishes along there, and we can see what, if we look at it as a function of x, we uh, vary, vary the values of x, that's just say we move along just a, a, a line of constant x, and we can see that the roots of the two things are colliding at this point. But if we do the same thing with this other example, with this more sophisticated example here, we get a, a more sophisticated picture, which is a bit harder to draw. Um, we get something that looks like, um, like uh, if I've got it right, somewhere around this sort of picture here, and something like this for, for the C, I think. And then the B is something a bit like this. Um, and a bit like this, maybe. Let's say roughly that's the idea of the picture anyway, if I know I've got all the details right. Um, but the, the point being that there's something very strange that happens here at this point. If you think about the various x values, because our r of x depends only on x, it only sees different x values. And when x hits here, there's something very strange happening. What's happening is that x is in front of the y squared. And so this guy, when it hits x is 0, is actually dropping degree. And you calculate a resultant by a different formula depending on what, what degree you're using. So because for most values of x, this is this is quadratic, these are both quadratic, you'd use a certain size of matrix to do it, right? You'd use a, a 4 by 4 matrix. But when x goes to 0, these things drop in degree and you use a smaller matrix to compute the resultant. So what we're finding is, is a bit sneaky, that the resultant, when you calculate it, thinking of, of y as the variable and x as a, as a coefficient, uh, coefficient function, uh, it gives you one thing, but if you plug in x is 0 and then calculate, you get a different thing, and then if you calculate the result and then plug in x is 0. And geometrically, that has to do with the fact that this guy hasn't got as many roots at this point. Oh, sorry, I've also missed one of the roots. The other should be, should also be a line here. Um, I think that's right. So this b has, has still has a root here, but two of the roots disappeared. Um, when we when we moved in toward x is zero, these t this root and this root dis disappeared. So you, when you hit x is zero, you don't see them. You only see that one root. And in fact, in this example, I won't do the calculation. You can calculate out that r of x is actually x squared. And so it's behaving very strangely here. 
But that's not because of a common factor. It's because of a degree drop. Because of the degree drop, if you calculate R, the resultant, by treating this thing as, as polynomials in Y with, with coefficients depending on X, you get this result. But if you, if you were instead to plug in X is zero and then count the result, you get a different result from this. You get a different answer. And so the problem really here is that uh, you get a, a drop in degrees because B of uh, zero Y is Y, C of zero Y is Y plus one has no common factor. And so it's though the resultant isn't dropping by uh, because of that reason. So what's happening is that if you if you were to plug in, if you do the resultant um, first, uh, uh, then plug in x is zero, you get zero. But if you plug in x is zero first and then do the resultant, you don't get the same thing. You get a different answer. Um, you get the resultant of these two um, of these two expressions should be uh, I think should be minus one. It's not zero. So you plug in, uh, you calculate the result, and then plug in x is zero, you get you get zero. But if you uh, plug in x is zero, then calculate the result, and you get a non-zero answer. So roughly speaking, summing this up, uh, the resultant uh, r of x uh, can vanish uh, because of degree drop. Even when there's no common factor. And that's bad because we were hoping that to use the result to calculate common factors and therefore to calculate roots of things because actually the, these common factors will force it to be roots at least after some algebraic extension of the field. Um, but uh, it's not working because there could be uh, a result vanishing because of degree ra drop rather than common factor. And, and there are more sophisticated examples, only sli slightly more sophisticated example which we could look at um, if we were to take b of x and y to be x squared y plus y and c of x and y to be 2xy squared plus y plus 1, then the resultant uh, as, a, as a function of x, again through taking resultant in y as the variable, uh, calculates out uh, to be x times x plus 1. And so it's 0 exactly when x is 0 or x is minus 1. And you want to calculate out what happens at these two different locations. When your x is 0, what's going on? If you plug in x is 0 here, b of uh, 0, y is just y. c of 0, y is y plus 1. And those have no common factor and no roots in common. Um, but when x is minus 1, you get a different story. b of minus 1, y is minus y times y minus 1. And I'll leave you to check that c of minus 1y is minus uh, 2 times y minus 1 times y minus a half, apparently. No, so you can see that there is actually uh, arising a common factor um, showing up in there. So here we had um, no common factor, but the resultant uh, vanished. Result was 0 here because of degree drop. So this was this was a degree drop that caused a, a resultant of zero. This wasn't a degree drop; it was a common factor. They're still um, at their are they still their highest degree? I suppose not. But anyway, there there there's there's it's this this guy here that's causing us to have this uh, this um, d the resultant vanish because because there is actually a common factor. Th there's another issue which is that, that we talked about common factors, but we really care more about. Uh, actually solving polynomial equations uh, than, than about finding common factors. Um, and so uh, when we draw pictures, we can sometimes see that there are these roots. So let's make this guy be x squared plus y squared minus so on. And this one, uh, c of xy, be x minus 1 squared plus y squared minus 1. So in a picture, these things look like um, a circle. I guess b is this circle and then uh, C uh, vanishes on uh, some circle like this, uh, same radius, shifted over. And um, and so what you can do is you calculate out the, the, the resultant, and if you'd find that the resultant of these two is uh, 2x minus 1 all squared, if you calculate it out and factor it, which I won't do for you, um, you can check that. And so that's um, that uh, resultant of x is 0 
if and only if um, uh, that's if and only if x is a half and you can see why it's x is a half because that's where these things intersect so it's working very nicely and it's giving us the intersection point of the two but it's only telling us that at x equals a half there is some intersection um, or degree drop uh, it turns out it's not a degree drop it's it's actually an intersection but it's actually a pair of intersections and so we're not counting the not rate number of intersections we're only getting um, we're only getting uh, that 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 point something happens but in fact if you if you look very carefully at what happens there you plug in x is a half where the result vanishes into these things and check to see what happens um, you can factor them out um, at least over the real numbers you can factor them out like this and c of one half y is as it turns out exactly the same expression y minus root 3 over 2 and y plus root 3 over 2. And so they have actually two common factors. They have a common factor and another common factor. So they have two common factors in common. That's also related to the fact they have two, two roots. They have two linear factors, which give you two values of y. One y is root 3 over 2, and y is minus root 3 over 2. You'll get these two points. So we're not counting the right number of roots. If we look at it this way, our resultant would only seem to vanish at one point, which would give us that there's, okay, there's at least one common root, one common one point of intersection of the two curves. But there are actually two, so we're missing something. So how can we fix all of these various problems that we're running into about uh, not finding the right number of roots and, and, and about degree drops causing causing resultants to vanish when we won't want them to vanish when we want to count how uh, I'll count all these intersections? So here's the idea. Um, it's actually maybe I should draw the picture first. Very simply, it's that if I were to take the picture that I just had of two circles, which intersect at two points directly on top of each other. All I have to do is just just uh, slightly alter that figure and then um, the two intersections no longer occur right on top of each other. Uh, we can make sure that, that, that the result will vanish here and vanish here because of different uh, intersection points. And so we'll count them separately. So that, that fixes this problem. This problem being that the problem here is that we only found one zero to the resultant, but there were actually two intersection points. Here we find two different zeros to the resultant, and that would count that there are two different intersection points. So let's put that into a lemma. We're going to have k as a field, um, and as usually I'll, uh, I'll usual, I'll let x be x1 to xn, and then I'll make also a variable, single variable y, um, and then we'll have b of xy and some c of xy polynomials. Uh, non-constant uh, polynomials, non-constant polynomials, obviously over this field in these variables, and um, then we want to fix our problems in some finite extension field. We can't stay inside the field we were given, maybe, but we can go up a bit. Um, uh, there is a constant constant lambda equals, well, it's really a vector of constants. It's a lambda equals lambda 1 dot 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 lambda n, um, a vector of constants, so that so that both uh, b of xy and also c of xy, um, uh, when we replace, uh, well, maybe I should write it as both, uh, when we uh, change to, we change them to, instead of b of x, y, c of x, y, we look at b of x plus lambda, plus what do I want to do, y, y, lambda, and y. So I add this, which I can think of as a small perturbation, although we haven't really made lambda small, but intuitively it's slightly altering the, uh, this expression. But it's just a linear change of variables from what we had. We had x, y, and we put a little bit of uh, y times lambda in there. It's still linear in x and y. y lambda is a constant, so this is just a linear change of variables. And c plus y lambda y. Um, uh, we get rid of, of all uh, x's in the highest order. Uh, order, uh, or sorry, highest order uh, terms uh, in y in both of them and, and that avoids uh, that means there's no degree drop there can't be any degree dropping um, uh, why because uh, 
because degree drop happened because we had, we had a problem with, with the highest degree term when we did our resultant in Y. But the problem with the highest degree term might drop in degree because it might actually have some, some place where, it, where it's vanishing. But in this case, the gut rev all X's, so in fact the highest term in Y is constant. And so the, ch the degree is constant. So there isn't any problem with degree drop anymore. So let's let's see this um, in this in, in action. Um, if we take one of our examples, so b of x y is x y squared plus y, and c of x y is two uh, x y squared plus y plus one. Um, and this was bad because the highest order term in y has an x in it, highest order term in y has an x in it, and those simultaneously vanish when the x is zero, dropping degree, and that was bad. Um, but let's try b of x, y is b of x uh, plus y lambda y. And if you plug that in, I won't do it for you, I'll let you expand it all out. You get a lambda y cubed plus x, y squared plus y, I think, something like that. And then um, if you let c of x, y be c of x plus y lambda y, then you similarly get uh, rid of, of any trouble. You get a 2 lambda y cubed plus 2x y squared plus y plus 1. It's not a bad idea to actually try it, really plug it in and check and see that you get rid of this. Um, but the point is more or less that when you plugged in um, x plus lambda y in here, you created another, another y term. The lambda times y creates a, a third order y term to take over. This thing has degree 3, but it's got degree 3 because it got one of the degrees from the x and two from the y. If we could change that into a y, or put in a plus lambda y in there, we get a, a y to the, to the third term, and that'll be the highest degree term. That's what happened here. Now when you calculate out the resultant of, uh, of x and y of, well, let's say the resultant of the new polynomials in x and y, um, as uh, in, in the y variable, um, then it turns out you get minus lambda squared times lambda plus 1 plus x. And lambda we can think of as just uh, just a constant as long as, it, as long as it doesn't cause any trouble for any of these calculations. For in this example, it's, it, it'd be almost you know, anything, pretty much anything lambda would do, uh, non-zero. Um, so, uh, so you get this very simple uh, expression and you can see that it is zero uh, if and only if um, x is minus lambda minus 1. Um, and so you get a, a common factor where you get a common factor when that happens of um, uh, you get a common factor I think of y minus 1 I hope um, something like that but I'll let you check it. So it's a very easy thing to check that it's all working out perfectly by plugging in values and see what happens. And, and it's it's helpful to repeat this with this example to think about what happens before and after. I don't want to. I don't have enough room to write it all out. But before the before, meaning in other words, when we calculate with b of x y, c of x y that we were given um, in that last example, and then after when you calculate with the um, capital B of x y and this capital C of x y, let's do with with real numbers so we can see what it looks like. Um, we found that the picture. Uh, was something a bit like, somewhat, very roughly, something like this, and something like uh, this, I don't know, something like that maybe, and then um, the B, so that was the C, and the B I think is somewhat roughly like this, um, and something like this. And the problem occurred um, somehow uh, not over here, this was perfectly fine. We were perfectly happy with that one, but we weren't happy with this because there seemed to be a problem. There was actually some kind of nasty degree drop happening. I haven't drawn the picture very well, but something along those lines. Um, and then if you change the variables, so I should have drawn this much, much more carefully, but something along that line happens, and then if you change the variables uh, to these ones for some value of lambda, which I think should be maybe positive to make this work, um, then you'll see that you can get a similar picture, but um, maybe the B is now doing something like this, and the C, and these are still fine. These, these were fine before, and they're still fine. Um, 
they're crossing somewhere over here, and then these two. But the point is that this this vertical line is no longer vertical, it's tilted. And so what you get is a picture that looks something maybe like this. I'll leave you to check all the details and draw the pictures carefully. But uh, what happens is something like that. So some weird feature where there was a kind of vertical asymptotic behavior here um, goes away because it's not vertical anymore. And if it's not vertical, it's not a problem because the resultant is only going to be a function of the x variable. It's only going to feel what goes on along along vertical lines because it's a function of x and this is x. Um, it's only, uh, the resultant is only uh, a function, maybe you should call it r of x for the resultant of this guy and r of x for this guy. It's going to, the res resultant's going to have uh, notice in, in these variables, this bad behavior. It's going to uh, go to zero here, but it's only caused, it's not really caused by an actual crossing of the two curves. It's caused by some kind of vertical asymptote thing. But um, but here, the crossing of the curves is going to make this result vanish, but there's nothing going to make it vanish over here, and so we're not going to get into any trouble. Okay, so we want to prove that result um, that I stated about being able to shift these things and get rid of degree drops um, uh, by, uh, by putting some little lambda in here. Um, the result depends only on highest order terms. We're also we're saying we get rid of the, the highest order terms to start having these y's in them. And so I won't uh, go into any detail in saying that um, because it depends only on highest order terms, um, which shifts them to produce a highest order term in y, which is a degree equal to the whole thing. Um, therefore, it's good enough to assume, um, you can assume uh, that, the, that the polynomials are homogeneous because you can drop the lower order terms. You just keep the highest order terms and don't worry about anything else. Um, and now, and I'm not giving too much detail on that argument, really. Um, if you take, um, B, plug in y is 1, you should get a, you get a non-zero polynomial over some infinite field, or at least some large enough field extension. He said it was true for finite field extension, so uh, effectively you could make it an infinite field, but we, because we just make, or just make it large enough, as large as it needs to be, so large that, uh, that this makes sure this thing's not everywhere, zero. Um, so, so, not, so it's not zero somewhere. And therefore, we can just um, pick something where it's not zero, some lambda where b of lambda one is not zero, and then um, and we can similarly, and we also want to have c of lambda one also non zero, which I won't worry about. But let's just worry about b fixing b, and we'll, we'll let c take care of itself. It's essentially the same argument, the same story. We we can manage to do them both at the same time. It's not too difficult to convince yourself of. So this means therefore that b plus y lambda y. If you expand it all out, is uh, d, where the d is degree of b, um, the total degree of the original original b. Um, it's this guy, b of lambda 1 plus lower order terms. I'll, I'll leave you to convince yourself of that by just looking at expanding this thing out into, into monomials and, and just see what you get when you plug in. And since we can get this working for b uh, by picking a, you know, a, a suitable lambda to make this non-zero, we just need to make sure we can mine one where they're both non-zero in this suitable extension field. You can do it, which I, again, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of, of effort to, to, to convince yourself. So I'll, I'll leave you the, more of the details of that. So um, we can conclude from this a, a rather long uh, statement, a corollary of this. It's a bit long to, to put down on paper. Um, that uh, So if we take, again, it's a one variable y, it's just a variable, and then x is going to be, as usual, a bunch of variables, x1 to xn, and then k is obviously going to be a field. Um, and then we have polynomials. Um, uh, polynomials b of x, y, and c of x, y, polynomials over that field. Um, and then we get, again, we let r of x be the resultant in the y variable to eliminate out, result out the y variable and leave the, only the x. Um, and um, we can say that for any uh, constant uh, a, if um, b of this is something we've already essentially seen. I'm not really going to prove this bit. That if, if these two uh, have a common factor, then um, then we'll find that the the resultant is zero. Okay, we already really know that, um, but we want to say that if uh, the coefficient of y of 
highest degree of well of um uh of the well of the highest uh, degree um in both uh b of x y and c of x y uh has constant x uh, con uh, it's constant in x um then um and that's what we've already arranged then uh the resultant uh of uh a is 0 is 0 at any at so well at some x equals a if and only if um there is a common factor moreover um then um uh, r of x um is the zero polynomial in x if and only if b of x y and c of x y uh have a common factor polynomial in x y polynomial in x and y and of positive degree and that's really just again the gauss lemma that enables us to make sure that we start working with rational functions but in the end we can always manage to get them to be polynomials and so again i, I won't really uh, go into this in any detail it's it's essentially uh things we've already seen before um, and we know how that the result can be expressed by this sort of u of x and so on and so forth. Somehow the resultant is some uh, expression about a u and a v polynomial with the with the um, b and the c polynomials multiplied by them. So um, so I won't I won't give a proof of that. A, a, a result that we can get out of this, which is uh, rather rather deep and um, a corollary of all of this, which is um, which is somewhat deeper, is uh, given a finite set any finite set of polynomials in some variables again it's x is x1 to xn each of the x sizes as usual just a single variable um uh then either oh over a field over a field um either we have um one possibility in some finite extension finite field extension finite degree field extension of k um, so we can extend by some adding some root to some polynomial then there is a point some x equals something or other uh, in which at, at which it's at which they all vanish or um, in some finite and in, in possibly some other some in some finite uh degree extension field of k um the ideal they uh, generate is all uh of the polynomials in well not some finite extension what i want to say i want to say some sort of extension capital k uh, and they generate all of all the polynomials. So this is sometimes called the weak Nostellensatz, and this is an important basic result that there's sort of two extreme cases. Either you can find a solution of all of your equations, or in fact you can write every polynomial somehow in terms of the polynomials that that, that are show up in your equations. So um, let's see if we can come up with a proof. Um, the uh, the 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 case of one variable and one polynomial. Let's see. Let's just save just one polynomial. Uh, uh let's start off with that case okay um and uh let's suppose in, in the simplest case that it that it is, suppose that it's constant uh on uh, on the points in in every extension which is the same as saying that, that in some algebraic closure it's just constant when you plug in values of x coming from the from from all these extensions it's always constant and that means that it's constant on the on the algebraic closure um uh suppose that that happens so we're supposing this and this um then um we can subtract that constant and so it's zero um on 
uh, everybody in the closure, and we know that that closure is infinite, and that implies that it's a zero polynomial. Um, so we subtracted that constant, and we got to the case of the zero polynomial, and therefore when you have put the constant back in, it actually has to be a constant. It's a constant polynomial. If the constant is zero, um, so we're again dealing with the case there's only one polynomial in our collection, uh, our constant is zero, uh, then it's obvious that it, it's sat satisfied everywhere. So it has a solution. We did show it has a solution, or else you can somehow, it has this, this ideal being all the polynomials. And that's so fine, that has a solution. And what if the constant is non zero? Um, suppose it's some constant c, and that is somehow. Um, that's the value of our polynomial everywhere, but our polynomial is now a constant, just a constant number, a constant element of our field. And then uh, then every polynomial, every polynomial over our field, say p of x, take any polynomial, is uh, p of x can be written as a multiple of c. It's c times p of x over c for a non-zero constant. And that works out to give us the result because it says so. Uh, all polynomials in our field are in fact um, uh, they are exactly the ideal generated uh, by our uh, by the polynomials we had in our collection which was just this guy C itself okay so that's one case done if there was one polynomial um, we've we've got it sorry there's, that's if there's one polynomial and it's constant on on that's what if it's not constant um, I have the not constant on uh, k bar in case, so it's non-constant, and we have to figure out what to do with that about that to try and find a root. So it's not constant on this guy, so it must must be two different points there in on which it takes different values, and all we'll do is just draw a line between them and unrestrict uh, to a line on which it takes two different values. So it's got to be as I think thought of as intuitively think of it as sort of a function. It's got two different values. Um, so you get a non-constant polynomial in one variable. I'll leave you to worry about the details. How do you write down such a variable? But you make a variable that goes varying along. The, sorry. Um, you, you, so so if it's not constant, on, uh, then 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 there are two points on which on which it takes different values. Draw a line between the two points and parameterize that line by some variable, and then you get a one variable polynomial, which is non-constant, and therefore it has a root in the algebraic closure, and that's done. So it has to have a root somewhere. It has to go to zero somewhere. Um, somewhere in there. Okay, so that's done. So it's not constant on uh, on, the, on the closure, then, then we're done. So that's the case of one polynomial. Um, what if we have more than one? So if there are, are, are two polynomials in this collection, um, and that'll be enough once we understand two, we'll understand everything, uh, all, all the higher numbers pretty clearly. So let's just think about two polynomials. Then we'll take the resultant, um, and that's a polynomial in one less variable, the result in some one of the variables, it doesn't matter which one, and we can always change uh, the variables linearly if we like, and then we've only got the leftover variables, the result depends on whatever variables we didn't result in doubt, we result in doubt the x, well, one of the variables, xn, and we're left with uh, n minus one of these variables. Um, and um, so uh, so what we can say therefore is um, is that this guy uh, has to be somehow expressible as something in all the variables x1 to xn times uh, say b of x. So if our polynomials are b of x and c of x as usual, then um, it's possible, and we know that it's even explicit, there's an explicit recipe for right around a u and a v, so that the resultant is expressible in this way. In terms of this, this is all the x1 to xn variables in it, but they cancel each other out and, and leaving a result that only depends on the 1 to xn variables. Um, so, so this guy, therefore, in particular, is, is, is in the ideal because the ideal consists of any combinations of, of, of elements with any uh, polynomials in front of them. And that's, so that's in the ideal um, generated by b of x and c of x. We want to prove that that ideal is everything or else that there is a common root. And so what we find is that um, if r uh, of these remaining variables is constant, um, let's say then, uh, in, uh, then, um, then there's a constant in the ideal, uh, let's say non-zero, then um, 
uh, there's a constant, say, equal to C, and then the ideal is generated by C is C, and it's, uh, well, it contains, by the same trick we did before, it contains C times any polynomial at all divided by C, which is just that polynomial, and so it contains all polynomials. Um, so that was our second case. We wanted to prove either that it has a root or that it contains or the ideal contains all the polynomials. So that if this guy's a non-zero constant, we got all the polynomials. So what if it's a zero constant? It's just a zero polynomial. Um, then we know that uh, that implies that um, b of x and c of x have a common factor. And again, we can apply Gauss lemma, which we have to apply by induction in numbers of variables, but we can apply Gauss lemma. And so, um, so they have a common factor, and so they both vanish. Like no, non-constant, non uh, positive degree common factor, they both vanish where it does. Uh, at any point in k bar where it does. And we've already done the one, one polynomial case, so that reduces from two polynomials down to one. We've already done one polynomial, so that's done. So now we can assume we're on the, the remaining case, which is that r of x1 to xn minus 1. We already checked what happens if it's a non-zero constant and if it's a zero constant. And so now we're on the non-constant case. And so by our one variable theory, it must have, uh, it must have a root. And so, uh, so it has a root. Uh, it has, in other words, a zero somewhere in, in setting the values for those variables somewhere in in this k bar to the n minus 1. And then above that root, that, that root's a point, point where there has to be a common factor uh, in, uh, in the remaining xn variable of b of x and c of x. And so therefore, there'll be a root, a positive degree common factor. And where that positive degree common factor vanishes, there'll be roots uh, in uh, k bar. And so that's done. Now, um, that, does, that only deals with the case of two polynomials, but it shows you more or less how you'd reduce from two down to one by taking a resultant. And similarly, a, more, a slightly more sophisticated argument would be able to take any number of polynomials and reduce down to one fewer by taking a resultant in essentially the same argument. In the next um, lecture, we'll talk about a much more abstract notion about quotient rings. If we have an ideal, we can mod it out just like we modded out um, the, some some numbers from from the integers, the multiples of a given of a given integer from the integers, will be able to mod out any ideal from a ring in some sense, turn it to zero.